Good evening and welcome to another International Dermatology Education Foundation educational series webinar. My name is Roxanne Chabot from RBC Consultants. This evening, we are going to have a fireside chat on novel therapeutic approaches for the management of actinic keratosis with Dr. Brad Glick. Dr. Glick is a member of the AAD Board of Directors, Residency Program Director, Larkin Palm Springs Hospital, PIGSI Clinical Research, and ASDS Advocacy Ambassador in Miami, Florida. For our moderator this evening, we have Dr. Leon Kursik, who is the President of the International Dermatology Education Foundation, Clinical Professor of Dermatology, ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis, and Medical Director of Physician Skin Care, Derm Research, and Skin Sciences. We'd like to thank our supporter, Almoral, for making this educational event possible. Before we begin, a couple of logistic tips. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues or if you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit your question using the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up. If you could please fill in the survey and send it back to us, we'd truly appreciate it. And finally, within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. Again, if you have any questions for our faculty, please use the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen, and I wrote a little note there so you could see where you needed to write in the questions. So without further ado, I will pass the floor virtually to Dr. Kursik. Thank you, Roxanne, and good evening, everyone. Greetings from Louisville, Kentucky and welcome to tonight's fireside chat. Um, so next slide, Raksan, please. So this program is brought to you by International Dermatology Education Foundation. IDF is a nonprofit organization whose principal mission is to raise awareness and improve dermatology care all over the world through education, especially in underserved areas. Next slide, please. And we have done several programs, both on live as well as virtually. And some of our previous educational sessions, as you can see, not only in US, but also in Canada and all over the world, as well as in Europe and uh, Asia. So tonight, we are very lucky to have Dr. Brad Glick, who comes to us from Florida, who's a great, great friend of mine, a good friend of mine, and he is the residency program director in Larkin Palm Springs Hospital, as well as he is not only a great clinician, a great researcher, but also he volunteers his time to many, to many causes of dermatology, being a member of the board of the directors at AAD, working so hard for National Psoriasis Foundation, as well as ASDS advocacy for our patients. So, Thank you, Brett. Thank you for joining us tonight. And he's going to discuss new treatment options for actinic keratosis. And we're going to do a little bit different tonight. I am not going to disappear. I'm going to be here and we're going to chat as we go along. Thank you and welcome, Brett. Well, first of all, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you to Roxanne and RBC Consultants. To you, Leon, as always, it, it's, it's always a pleasure to work with you. And I think, like you said tonight, uh, it's like we're sitting in a couple of chairs. You see the little fireplace there. The fire's, you know, uh, you know, really, really active right there, and it's keep us warm. And we'll talk about AK tonight. What's kind of funny when 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 you asked me to do this, I'm figuring, you know, I'm a psoriasis guy. Now, why am I talking about AKs? But you know, AKs are our life. I mean, it's all day, particularly in South Florida. I see actinic keratosis in almost every room I go into. And, and we use a lot of cryotherapy. What we'll talk about tonight is, you know, what else there is. We'll talk a little bit about some clinical trial data, some consensus information, I think, which is really important in our world of dermatology so we can sort out how we use all these different modalities uh, for uh, treating AKs. So we have a polling question. And just to make sure that you're all paying attention. So recent AAD consensus for AK management indicates strong evidence for use of all except 
So pick one of these choices, all except 5% 5 fluorouracil topical, 5% amiquimod cream, Ingenol Mebutate, or UV photo protection. We'll give you a couple minutes here and, and then we'll jump into the uh, body of the lecture. There's gonna be two more polling questions, so be on the lookout for this, pay attention. All right, well, good job. So you, you figured out that, you know, there's probably not very good uh, information on Ingenol Mebutate, and as we'll talk about, it's not available to us here in the States anymore, and, and for that matter, for several reasons uh, um, uh, around the world. But we'll talk about this in terms of consensus. So, Brett, before you go on, let me ask you something. You know, mm -hmm. this always comes up, and the payers especially, do we really need to treat AKs? Why are we treating AKs? Do they really become squamous cells? What's the deal? So, you know, what we're going to see tonight is there's variable information on that. But it is clear, even though there's differences in what the literature shows, whether it's 10%, whether it's 15%, whether it's 30% or more, 60%, there's variability in the data. But one thing we do know is actinic keratoses move on to become squamous cell carcinomas. You know, it's interesting, Leon, I was listening to a video today from Clay Cockerell, and Clay was reviewing some data, you know, where up to 60% of AKs become squamous cell carcinomas, yeah. and there's still individuals that believe that AKs really are intraepithelial squamous cell carcinomas. And we'll see some of the reasons why in terms of the way that they grow, in terms of the way that they behave subclinically. So let's jump into these guidelines for care for management of, of actinic keratosis. It's just published this past year. Obviously, um, American Academy of, of Dermatology guidelines, their objective was to really look at these um, ultraviolet light induced lesions called actinic keratosis, a multidisciplinary uh, work group led by Dan Eisen and also uh, individuals like Todd Schlesinger. And so um, they used the, what's called the grade a component or the grading uh, assessment of different features of, of actinic keratosis and the different management protocols. And the most important management protocol, protocol is sun protection, UV protection, uh, whether it's uh, uh, sunscreen, UV protected clothing. And there's strong evidence for this. There's strong evidence for the use of 5-FU, which I believe most of us use most of the time. Also for topical amiquimod. And ironically, one of the newer generation therapies, which is terbanabulin, uh, which is newer to the market, just really the last couple of years, also had a very strong level uh, of evidence. And so if you look to the right, what's the certainty of the evidence in using this grade system uh, with this uh, multidisciplinary consensus group? And you know, for UV protection, we know it's good practice statements. And for things even like terbanabulin, a uh, high level of evidence, and, and ironically, for fluorouracil and amicomod, moderate levels of evidence, and this really reflects uh, what's in the literature and what's out there. Uh, some other significant levels of evidence, of course, is going to be for cryotherapy. There's a significant amount of literature regarding the use of, of cryotherapy, but you know, cryotherapy has limitations in our clinic, clinics because it's, it's targeted therapy. And you can see there, there are some also some other conditional levels of evidence, low and moderate degrees of evidence-based medicine for the use of AKs and uh, use of uh, cryosurgery in combination with 5-FU versus cryotherapy alone uh, with diclofenac, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that we also use for AKs. And so we'll get into a lot of these therapies uh, as we move forward here. So what are AKs? Well, we know that they develop from UV exposure and chronic uh, actinic damage in our patients, particularly here in South Florida. Do you freeze a lot of AKs in Kentucky? Oh, yes. Now, one thing I got to tell you, though, it's not cryotherapy. It's cryosurgery. So the cryotherapy is for the acne, you know, when she, she, she frits the liquid nitrogen, and the code for that is 17340. As we know, the AK code is 17,000. Just for documentation purposes, 17,000 is cryosurgery. 
you know, it's interesting. The patients will call us sometimes and say, you froze some spots in my skin. It says you did surgery. Surgery. Go, yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they don't get it sometimes. But, yeah. you know, we know that these AKs, there's a marked proliferation of keratinocytes. And it's not just the squamous epithelial, epithelial keratinocytes. We know the hallmark of the development and, and really this downward growth of AKs and the development of these subclinical AKs we talk about really come from basal cell keratinocytes. And, and that's what this means in this third bullet here, which they're often not treated. Some of them we can see. And if they're left untreated, as we just discussed, they may, may move on to develop squamous cell carcinomas. And you know, Leon, we just don't really know what that percentage is. But even if it is little, it's 10 or 15% of AKs, it's enough to be concerned that if we can get them treated, whether it's targeted or if we can treat a field as we're gonna talk a lot about tonight, that it is incredibly re relevant and important to treat these. Uh, you see some of the risk factors here, predominantly men. We see a lot of AKs in the bald and scalps of men here, our elderly patients in South Florida. They're red, they're reddish brown, pink, scaly, papules, plaques. You know, it says right here, um, uh, one millimeter to up to two centimeters. But Leon, I don't know about you, but when I see something that's a pink scaly plaque, that it's one centimeter, one and a half centimeters, two centimeters, this is in all the textbooks, but that is not an actinic keratosis. Um, uh, that's a squamous cell carcinoma too, proven yeah. otherwise. That's not getting frozen, it's getting a biopsy. And clinically, and even just historically, typically AKs don't itch. Uh, but sometimes they do. There's an unintact skin barrier. We know when you biopsy AKs, as we see here, and you see, especially in the second picture, um, a, a secondary AK, you'll see a significant inflammatory infl infiltrate, which is mostly lymphocytes, but if it's admixed with eosinophils, and sometimes the patients complain of itching. And there's a variable presentation of AKs. Uh, primary type, secondary type, so slightly palpable, moderately palpable, and certainly grade three AKs or tertiary AKs, uh, which are what we see clinically as hyperkeratotic AKs. And those are hard to treat. I don't know about you, Leon. I curette those first, and then I use cryotherapy. Yeah, sometimes I do the same, depending on the, you know, the patient's um, tolerance level, but I like to get rid of them and curette them first, absolutely. What's your threshold for, um, you know, uh, moving on, if you will, from using that cryo can and then even that same day adding in um, a, a topical field therapy or even doing photodynamic therapy? What's your threshold? How do you make that determination? So really depending on the number of the lesions on the patient, the area. So it all depends. But sometimes I actually give the topical and then bring them back and then freeze the leftover. Love it, love it. And I do I do similarly. But you know, my my practice partner and the associate director in our residency program, what I learned from him is he has a curette in his hand when he's got AKs. He's scraping those things, CNC, you know, curatage and cryo surgery, not therapy. Um, he does a lot of CNC and I and I think it does work beautifully. It's it's nice to learn from our colleagues just like we're doing tonight. You know, so it's ironic I mean? where I did more surgery fellowship, yeah. Dr. Moss actually, they did used to uh, scrape and curate those, by the way. I think it's very helpful. And I didn't do it. I didn't do it for the first year as a practice. Yeah. But I learned this from my practice partner. It's been very helpful. So here we have an AK forming on the left. Uh, but on the right, what we see is the percentages in this one study of, of processes that may lead to the development uh, of uh, invasive squamous cell carcinoma, 25% of the time, 30% of the time, almost 40% of the time, but it depends on the development of those AKs. And if you see from the caption, what we see in subclinical AKs, and we see this histopathologically, there are phenomenon called crowding, uh, where you see this activity just beginning to happen in those basal cell keratinocytes. And this is not going upward, it's growing down into the dermis. And so we have this budding phenomenon and we see papillary sprouting. And when we see papillary sprouting, we're really getting a significant development of AKs uh, that are occurring subclinically. And this is where down the road, we're gonna get that nodular squamous cell carcinoma. And so we not only need to be treating what we see visibly, but at some point, those individuals who really have significant clinical AKs uh, are going to develop um, some, some squamous cell carcinomas. And this is where the field therapy concept comes in. Now, we have a couple of different pathways, Leon, 
that explain the progression to SEC. And the classical one is more or less what I just showed. Uh, AK, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary AKs leading to uh, invasive squamous cell carcinomas. But what is thought to occur more recently is this differentiated pathway. Pathway. You know, we saw that sprouting, that basal cell keratinocytic atypia that grows downward. And those are those AKs that are sitting below that balding scalp of a patient. And we're freezing those AKs. And we don't really know when this is going to happen, but you have to have an index of suspicion. And this is probably the opportunity to do that field therapy, to do photodynamic therapy, to consider chemical peeling. Maybe you like CO2 laser. What do you do in this situation? So I am not a device person. You know, I don't have a CO2 laser. I don't do any cosmetics. So I do basically, my tools are cryosurgery and the topicals. That's it. I don't even have PDT in my office. I have to be honest. Uh, that so, would be my next question. No PDT. Nope. Nope. I never, I never started it. And... You know, my patients, they come from far away. They don't want to come and sit there and do that. So they're in and out. And I think I am, I was able to manage so far with topicals and cryosurgery. You know, it's interesting. Um, uh, I don't do formal phototherapy in my practice. I do eczema laser and I've survived quite well. Uh, uh, in many years in managing our patients with psoriasis and even atopic dermatitis, although I think that phototherapy, ironically, not to be to my own contrary, is underutilized. And to your point, the crazy thing about our wonderful specialty is that there are so many tools for different things in the toolbox, and you can be successful using all of them. And we'll end tonight talking a lot about topical therapies and using them as monotherapy. And most of these topicals that we have, including some of the newer ones that we've had, work well on their own. And when we combine them with some of these modalities, as we see, they're quite effective. What about the pathophysiology of, of AKs and progression to SEC? And there's a little bit of redundancy here, but I, I wanted to point out these differences that I mentioned before. This is another study done by Fernandez, Rogueras, that was published really a number of years ago. But you can see some of the differences in intermediate progression when we have these subclinical AKs, classical progression. But there are maybe rates, as we talked about before, in differentiated progressions that we see in this small population of individuals studied with AKs, where there may be a progression of AK to squamous cell carcinoma that's as high as 60%. So this gets back to the significant question that Dr. Leon Kersick asked, and that was, should we treat them? Why should we treat them? This is one of the reasons why we treat this. And this is what we need to show the payers when they ask us, um, do you really need to treat these things? Why do you leave them alone? They're just some scaly skin lesions. Just put some moisturizer on it. And it's unfair. And I think that both you and I have seen many a time a biopsy. We've done a broad shave. And it says intraepithelial squamous cell carcinoma arising in a hypoplastic actinic keratosis. And it may even be one of those ones that the patient said, you know, Dr. Kersick, you've already froze that twice in this last six months. Um, you know, are you going to freeze it again? And the answer is no. And then you get that biopsy back that basically indicates you were doing the right thing all along, but it morphs. And this is why we treat actinic keratosis. So I'll, I'll tell you, Brett, the last three slides that you showed are so telling and really answered my question and that fundamental question that everybody is asking. And they are really educational, right to the point. I really appreciate those are really very good teaching slides. And the thing is, is that when you put dermatopathologists in the room and you ask them a question like, um, is this a mild or moderate or severely dysplastic nevus? You're going to get some different answers. But at the end of the day, we're going to do what's best for our patient. And one thing that we've learned from this last few slides is we need to treat AKs. And here's another reason why. This is a very nice study that was published in DMC Cancer by Hugh and Fang and colleagues and a whole bunch of authors. And they looked at changing trends in disease burden of non-melanoma skin cancer globally. And kind of the punchline here is that they looked at uh, disability life years, they looked at deaths, they looked at the overall impact of AKs and progression of AKs to squamous cell carcinomas. And, and what they basically found and what they tried to predict in looking at reviews of a whole host of, 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 
of data points in a, in a, a significant number of trials is, is they found that there were significant high rates of new cases of squamous cell carcinomas arising in actinic keratosis, that there were significant deaths that occurred as a result of AKs that have progressed to squamous cell carcinomas and these disability adjusted life years that impact, believe it or not, of quality of life on individuals who are being uh, treated for AKs along the way have a significant impact on one's overall health. And, and what they were able to show in this study is, first of all, if you step away, what's happening around the world? Now, in industrialized countries, as you look at the dark blue um, and some of the even lighter blue, there's a lot of actinic keratosis. There's a lot of squamous cell carcinomas. There are significant deaths from squamous cell carcinomas. And what this slide basically shows is there's a significant burden and impact of quality of life. And so as you see to the right, the numbers and age standardized rates of non-melanoma skin cancer related to incident deaths, disability adjusted life years, significant across many countries. And you'll see it's mostly in industrialized areas, but we don't necessarily know what's happening in undeveloped countries because there's not a lot of data from those countries. Suffice it to say, this is further proof in a different way of looking at squamous cell carcinomas and how they impact our patients and our specialty of dermatology. Furthermore, in, in this same assessment, these uh, authors assessed trends in non-melanoma skin cancer, the number of incident cases, deaths, again, uh, disease, um, uh, I'm sorry, disability adjusted life years, uh, now by sex globally, um, and looking at prognostication from um, looking at a whole host of, if you will, registry data, a host of clinical trials and clinical studies. And these shaded areas at least predict what is potentially going to happen moving forward. And we're not gonna get fewer squamous cell carcinomas. And if we buy into the fact that actinic keratoses move on to become squamous cell carcinomas, we're gonna have a lot of squamous cell carcinomas moving forward and both in men and women. And that's really what I'm showing here. And so it really doesn't matter necessarily from a gender perspective, uh, we're going to see later in this decade and into the following decade really an, up, uh, an uptick uh, in squamous cell carcinoma. And so if we buy into the fact that AKs will very much be a preceding um, issue where the development of squamous cell carcinoma is concerned, we really do need to be treating AKs. And so, uh, Leon, I think suffice to say in our lovely fireside chat here, our audience probably have gotten the memo that we should be treating our AKs and we really shouldn't have anyone busting our chops about doing so. And hopefully as time moves, moves on, and we know that we're facing some reimbursement issues coming in 2023, uh, hopefully we'll still be able to keep that cryo can in our hand. And I think we can. I think we have a really nice topical uh, treatment landscape, but we have to use it collaboratively in our patients with actinic keratosis. And we're gonna talk a lot about these therapies, amiquimod, fluorouracil, um, uh, the newer agent, terbatabulin. Uh, we're not really going to talk a lot about uh, uh, inginal mebutate, which you see at the bottom here, because it's not in our toolbox anymore. But the reason I'll talk about it a little bit later on is because it does speak to the point of compliance. Now, now Leon, did you ever use uh, inginal mebutate? I did use some when it was available. And I, I like the drug because of the fact that they did a very good study it's probably one of the well done studies you know until then we never had local skin reaction measurement right that was the first study that they looked at adverse events and i like that aspect of that that we have that information now and that has become the standard of care basically the standard in the clinical trials the following drugs have followed the same um criteria and I think the LSRs, those localized skin reactions, are very, very important because when you look at that clinical trial data, we then have to translate that to clinical practice. And having erythema and crusting and scaling uh, that goes on for four weeks or longer is not necessarily fun for our patients. And, and moreover, to me, the reason I just wanted to mention uh, Inginol Mebutate tonight was because it was a two or three day treatment, right? Two below the shoulders, the head and neck was a three day treatment, 
with a 0.0015% and then 0.05 for the below the shoulders. But the point is that it was only three days. So for my patients that had been FUDEX users and didn't want to do the two weeks, or we did um, the lower percentages at 0.5%, you know, and that was a, a one month protocol, or you did the two week protocol, it was still too long for a lot of my patients. And they liked the idea of three days. The only thing is, is it wasn't a three day treatment. It did last for quite some time. And some people were taking three, four weeks uh, to clear, uh, and yeah. they got those local skin reactions. It was very, very challenging. So. I think compliance was super high with Inginol Mebutate. And I think that's an important factor to take into consideration. And you know, one of the things I didn't mention in the consensus group from the academy is that they really felt that compliance was compliance adherence was extremely important. And we're going to look at a review of another paper that was just published in August of last year by Jim Del Rosso and April Armstrong and others, another consensus group that talked a lot about compliance and adherence. And here's our landscape. AK treatment options, we talk about cryo surgery, uh, targeted therapy, lesion directed, but we can't forget that field. We gotta be thinking always, even if you see three, five, eight, 10 clinical AKs, you've gotta be thinking that there are subclinical lesions in the background. And I actually talked to my, my patients about that. Uh, surgical modalities, we talked a little about CNC cryotherapy, uh, cryosurgery with curatage, uh, excising these things. Uh, some like to just do uh, curatage, PDT, and patient applied treatments. And we'll talk a lot about this in the ensuing slides. Now, we translate that, that whole um, algorithm into what is home based and office space. So our home therapies are typically going to be the topicals, right? You know, people are not really taking home chemical peels. And the interesting thing about home therapies is that, you know, they get a thumbs up from many patients, right? Uh, they don't necessarily want to come in and do PDT, but then again, um, PDT is pretty popular because you have the thumbs up person who likes to not be bothered with coming in and paying their copay in the office, but then you have the standoffish person who said, listen, don't give me something topical to use. I don't want to be bothered. If you can put something on me and clear up these things that you've been freezing for the last five years, I'm all for it. And I think all of these modalities have important roles. There's not a one size fit all for, for, for all patients. And so it's really nice that we have a lot in our toolbox, Leon. So, you know, what's exciting is now we are a little bit behind in this country. In Europe, they have the sunlight PDT, right? They uh, send the patient outside, sit on the bench for an hour or two. We don't do that here. Well, well oh, actually, I have to say that I do daylight PDT. I do some. Do? I mean, I do. I absolutely do. Because savvy patients whose scalps and faces you've been freezing for, I've been in practice 27 years, and I think you're probably about the same. Patients eventually go, I, stop with that cryo can. You've got to find another way. Give me a topical, combine a topical with something else. And they're savvy and they read. So I've had patients come to me and say, what about putting this stuff on my skin and let me do it outside? I've done it, Leon. The main reason why patients like they like PDT, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. But the thing about it is that I don't think it works that great. So that's just in my camp. But I haven't done it very much, maybe about 20, 25 times. Have you done it at all here in the States? I have not it? done it at all, but I wonder if I can. Because, you know, people like it. It's free, right? You go and sit in the sun. <laughs> the question becomes, you know, what kind of sun? Day, uh, in the morning or during the day or the noon time, you know, the, when the sun is the highest, um, how long do they stay? What if they stay three hours instead of six now? Are they going to burn? So all, there's all these questions that sort of makes me a little bit nervous, especially from a malpractice perspective. Well, the other thing, too, is that we don't have a lot of large um, um, trials, clinical trials, randomized trials that have been done for daylight PDT, and I think largely it's been anecdotal. I don't know about in Europe, and I have not reviewed that data, but, you know, nevertheless, um, I, I think it's intriguing for some, some patients, and, and, and it really speaks to this slide right here, patient preference, adherence, yeah. compliance. This is a very nice little study that was published. It is a number of years ago. It's looking at 10 years here, but there are many studies that have been done just looking at how our patients adhere to treatments in general, and here's a really nice article 
a very well-known article that speaks to the adherence or for more, the most part non-adherence to a variety of topical treatments. And what uh, Shergell and, and colleagues were able to demonstrate in this uh, study, which is really a survey of over 300 people, that they found significant uh, uh, non-adherence, non-compliance to therapies. About 52% of patients were non-adherent uh, when they had a three to four week long uh, protocol. Now, you know, I think, Leon, for the most part, when we use, let's pick an agent, 5-fluorouracil, for the most part, we're using two weeks. But we have some newer therapies that have been developed over the years, whether they're once or twice a day, they're four weeks. And those, those four weeks of therapies can get us to maybe a partial clearance uh, uh, in the clinical trials, let's say of 80%, which is pretty darn good. But for me personally, seeing what happens to my patients with, with um, you know, a lot of these topicals, four weeks is a tough sell. 69 of uh, individuals in this 305 uh, patient survey um, we're not adherent when it went over four weeks. And if you started getting into longer protocols, it was getting close Get to three quarters. And so, right, exactly. Forget it. And if you think about it, imiquimod, I believe the FDA approval, and I know I'm the one doing this talk tonight, so I should know these protocols, but I'm quite sure that the original protocol in the trial, and I think it was done by Edward Stockfell, but was twice a week for 16 weeks. And I think that's one of the reasons why Shergell and colleagues did this study, uh, but none of us did this. I mean, 16 weeks for preventing uh, subclinical lesions, treating those clinical lesions was just really, really not possible. So to, to, to me, shorter is really better. And, and you know, in, in moving forward, I'll tell you though, this, this slide really says it all. It's really everything that we have in our toolbox which for some patients, it may be PDT uh, with ALA or with MAL that could be at the center of it all and using a lot of these in combination. Now for you, fire chat, fireside chat <laughs> or, or not, I can't really ask you because you're not using it in your clinical practice, but I think for me, since I do have PDT in my practice and we are originators, we've been using it since the very beginning, I find some of my most significant treatment successes come with protocols where I pre-treat with a topical, or if I have someone who has an incomplete PDT response, who was one of those ones that was like this and said, I don't want the topical, but they don't necessarily get a dramatic response from PDT, then we do a follow-up short course with maybe either 5 or uracil We have a new agent in the toolbox that I've been using that we'll talk about a little bit later on, which is a really short course of therapy. And so I think combo, as we talk a lot about in our whole specialty of dermatology, putting therapies together in principle, sometimes work better than either one of them alone. And that's actually how I'm gonna finish up uh, tonight by talking about combination therapy. Brad, I always, always learn something. Go back for one second if you can. I see microneedling sure. there. Oh yeah. How does that work? Yeah, well, I mean, listen, if you, if you take away that stratum corneum and with microneedling, you actually create these little microfine holes. So if you put PDT on the skin, and for that matter, there's been studies looking at microneedling plus a topical. I mean, we do- So it's just for increasing the, enhancing the absorption. Uh, yes, the absorption and the penetration of the topical, uh, most certainly. And, and at the end, I'll show some of that too, although I've got a lot of data at the end and we won't necessarily get to every detail. And hopefully our audience will kind of uh, pick out some of the information and actually look up some of these studies. And so, you know, PDT really is at the center of, of a lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in our clinics. And so there's another polling question here. We're making sure that you're paying attention out there. So which of the following statements is incorrect regarding the primary requirements of photodynamic therapy? Select one, the use of a photosensitizer concentrated in a target tissue, the application of a cooling device, a light source with appropriate wavelength and energy, and the presence of oxygen. Um, which is the incorrect statement regarding the primary requirements of photodynamic therapy? We'll await your answers. Okay, well, you did great, smart audience. And so we know that for photodynamic therapy, we actually, if, if anything, 
we might give a cooling device for comfort, but we want to heat these patients up. We know that photo excitation works a lot better in a warmer environment. environment. And so, yes, you, you did quite well there. And those other components are primary components uh, of utilizing photodynamic therapy. And what is photodynamic therapy? Well, it's the use of a photosensitizer or, and or a prodrug that's concentrated in a target tissue. In our case here, because we know that PDT is used in managing cancers in general, uh, but for us, it's in a target area where there's an abundance of precancerous lesions known as AKs. Uh, it has to have a light source with an appropriate wavelength and energy and molecular oxygen. It drives the production of reactive oxygen species. And what that does is several things. It also creates an inflammatory uh, process where, for instance, depending on whether we're talking uh, apoptotic pathways or necrotic pathways, uh, results in targeted cell death. They want to really destroy that cell cycle. And, and really what um, PDT does is it hijacks the heme pathway. There's photo excitation. We have normal cells, we have cancerous cells. Here we have the porphyrin pathway where there's photo excitation of um, uh, PP8, I'm sorry, PP9 or protoporphyrin 9. And this photo excitation leads to destruction uh, of uh, abnormal uh, cells like we see uh, in actinic keratoses. And here's just a little bit of what happens dynamically. So we have the application of 5-ALA. We have protoporphyrin-9 in the presence of a light source. Uh, so let's say it's either blue light or red light. In this particular case, uh, we're showing a red light. And we see intracellularly that we get an abundance of reactive oxygen species and then also the development of immune cell recruitment, and this results in really a couple of different possibilities. With PDC, we'll see apoptosis, we'll see concurrent necrosis, and autophagy. And, 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 and in that setting, this is why in, in some patients, it, there's so much variability, Leon, because it depends on how long you leave the product on. You may get some more significant um, um, reactivity uh, when you have a longer incubation period. Um, uh, we have some patients that have very limited responses when we do our av average incubation time, which is going to be about an hour and a half. Some patients that don't have brisk reactions, we actually do overnight PDT. We put it on overnight and we treat them first thing in the morning. Uh, there's a period of oxidation. Um, there's significant production of reactive oxygen species leading to cell death, as you see down there in the caption uh, on the right. What's important in PDT is, is not only protoporphyrin excitation. In this case, it's with red light. You see to the left at about 417 nanometers, blue light. There's a significant degree of penetration there. But one of the reasons why red light probably works, uh, well, mostly for skin cancer, works very well for actinic keratosis, is because that wavelength in the red light is much further out. So we have a little bit more superficial penetration with blue light and PDT and that light source, so a little bit deeper penetration. And we may get some of those subclinical lesions uh, with red light, perhaps a little bit better uh, with red light than blue light. And really this says it all right here, the longer the wavelength, the deeper the penetration. And this is important because it's not just the surface lesions, and this may be why, you know, uh, um, ALA versus MAL, uh, which one works better? Probably MAL and red lights better for treating skin cancer. And then both light sources uh, with whatever uh, amino levulinic acid you want to use work quite well for field therapy for treating AK. So I think it's an important distinction that we separate clinical lesions from subclinical lesions as we've been alluding to along the way. And there's a variety of different preparations. I would say here, you're probably best using the branded products. I, don't, I, I just don't think you know what you get when you're using compounded uh, products. Now, there may be some online here that have a particular compounding pharmacy that they use for their amino levulinic acid. I have never done that. I've stuck to my products uh, that are available in my toolbox that I also know that are FDA approved. And there are some others here that we really don't use here in the States, but I wanted to reference them. Now, with one of the products that we have available, there's a nano emulsion. And the only reason I put this in here, Leon, is because it is about the penetration. And you raised a great point about why microneedling? Why would we use erbium laser? Why would you use CO2 laser? Because we want to get that product in. 
Well, there is a nano emulsion formula that's in the 20% gel, I'm sorry, the 10% gel that is available in our toolbox uh, that we can use to treat our patients with PVT. And it's really all about the penetrations. And so when you have something that's like in a, a liposomal vehicle, or in this particular case, a lipid nano vesicle, it might have a degree, a greater degree of penetration. And it turns out it does. And you see some of the ingredients in these nano vesicles that this particular agent has. This is actually very new and why I don't want to inappropriately get into any kind of branded device. I think it's important for the audience to know that we finally have something that's not just a similar semi-circular fixated source for the light. We have something that's a panel that's adjustable. And I think this is great for our individuals that are receiving photodynamic therapy. I'm not sure if it's available just yet. You can see the approval was in October. I believe that this was actually launched in terms of its present. Uh, actually, Leon, when you and I were at the scale meeting and just some clinical pictures. I mean, we see this uh, you know, all day when we do PDT, how well people can do. I will say that depending on incubation, depending on, um, on the product that you're using, there is a significant variability patient to patient to patient uh, in terms of their reactions. And I'm not so sure that 10 days post, when you see at the bottom there or 14 days post, that these are always our patients. Sometimes it's a little bit longer. It's certainly not sh short, at least uh, not in my camp. And others on, on, the, on the line may have uh, differences of opinion. And this is really just some data. It's a little bit of older data that I wanted to present to really show that the majority of the topical therapies that we've used for years have very similar ranges in terms of their complete clearances over time. And these are studies that are usually done over 12 or 16 weeks. And we have somewhere in that 40 to 60% range with most of the topical therapies. And for PDT, for complete clearance, we have ranges of in that 80 to 90% of improvements that holds for a number of months. And there are significant numbers of subjects in the clinical trials for PDTs that will hold these responses for as long as a year. And I wanted to present to the audience as well uh, some data that was head to head, because you know we've got We've got blue light, levulin, a 20% solution. We have a 10% uh, nano emulsion gel. And so there was a head-to-head -head trial. And, and for the audience, it's not so much to make a, a, a head-butting circumstance. This is a really nice split-phase study and really nicely compared both of these products, a standard blue light uh, uh, approach and incubation period, uh, complete lesion clearance, partial lesion clearance, which is usually 75% or greater clearance of the AKs. And just to summarize, both of these agents work very nicely. I think one of the differences is, and putting into, into consideration that the studies were done with a fixed incubation period uh, in that you know, uh, couple of hour range that's fixated, there will be variability in responses in clinical practice. So we saw similarities in efficacy. So you see the solution on the left, the gel on the right, very similar. But what we did see, which was very interesting, is we did, as you very nicely brought up, local skin reactions. You know, there's a significant number of local skin reactions that occur, whether it's topical therapies or photodynamic therapy. And this is erythema and flaking and scaling and crusting and swelling, vesiculation, pustulation, erosions that these patients get. And there's an actual grading system, like you said. Um, it's a zero through three, it's a four point scale and severe is three and an absence of these local reactions, this is zero. And, and this is what we're measuring here. And so it does appear in this very nice study published by Nestor and colleagues that there were a significant number of greater reactions in the solution uh, compared to this nano emulsion gel. In general, there are some potential uh, uh, issues of concern, contraindications, need for aftercare and adverse events. Uh, where the important safety information is concerned, really for both of, of our amino levulinic acids that we use here in the States. Certainly, if someone has a, a porphyria, uh, you really can't use this. If they're photosensitive, you're not going to use it. You can't really be in the sun a lot before you do PDT because you're using a light source. And we don't let our patients go out in the sun uh, while we incubate them in the office because then they'd be getting daylight PDT and that wouldn't be good. And we don't want to really pre-photo excite them. And, and so there are some limitations and, and restrictions. And so we provide careful education uh, to our patients accordingly. Let me keep moving on for time purposes, and that will give us an opportunity to do some discussion at the end, Leon, because I wanted to jump, jump into kind of this last part. 
and really talk about topical therapies. But before I do so, I mentioned this article before by Del Rosso and Armstrong and Daryl Regal and a whole host of really true experts in actinic keratosis. And in this expert consensus panel, where they really looked at sizing up AKs, you know, what are they? Do they really progress? And they did a systematic review querying the epidemiology, the natural of AKs, really much of what we've talked about tonight. And one of the most significant things that they came up with, which is what we've also discussed this evening, is there is a significant variability in our understanding of just how many AKs and what percentage of AKs will really move on to develop uh, into squamous cell carcinomas. But what they did find in their review of, for instance, clinical trial data and multiple meta-analyses that have evaluated multiple therapies that we've talked about today, our entire AK treatment landscape, they really found that shorter courses of therapy were more favorable for adherence and compliance. Shorter courses of therapy, which are some of the, the, the agents that we've had in the past that we've alluded to, tend to have fewer and lower levels of uh, localized skin reactions, and perhaps that may promote greater adherence and better long-term outcomes. So let's look at what we have in our toolbox. We have 5-FU, we have 5-FU and calcium cotrine. Um, Leon, just a quick question for you. Do you use 5-FU and calcium cotrine? And if yes, uh, what is your regimen? No, no, no. I just do 5-FU. I don't use it with calcium cotrine, no. So I've tried this before. I know it's published. It's not a large trial. Uh, a lot of uh, our colleagues use it because it's a four-day protocol. There's a five-day protocol. It's a seven-day protocol. But for me, I, I find it almost a little too irritating. It's 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 quite effective, but it's it's a little bit irritating. Now, I'll just very briefly mention Inginol Mevitate, primarily because for me, I used a lot of this agent. And unfortunately, in January of 2022, because of a study that was done that was head-to-head -head between amiquimod and Inginol Mevitate, they actually found a pretty significant number of individuals uh, that developed significant cancer, specifically squamous cell carcinomas, occurring right in the fields where the, where the Inginol Mevitate was being used. Moreover, there was also here in the state states um, uh, from the FDA, what really kind of led to its discontinuation, there were just reports of really significant reactions that uh, a number of individuals uh, that are in our practices were having. And so, you know, Inginol Mevitate, no more, it's not in our toolbox. But one of the things I really liked about it was a three-day or a two-day course of, of therapy, because in my camp, even if there was a progression of an inflammatory reaction, uh, patients like this because it was a really short course of therapy. We know that 5-FU uh, mechanistically is an anti-metabolite. It's a, per a pyrimidine analog. It really just de decreases DNA uh, synthesis. And this has really been our go-to, typically BID dosing for a couple of weeks. And this is what I was referencing about using 5-FU and calciprotrine together. Um, there are um, short courses of therapy. I believe the gold standard in, uh, anecdotal reports that we've seen as a four-day course of therapy was very nice. But for me, I, I found it a little bit irritating. I wanted to mention too, now, Leon, do you do any chemo wraps with your patients? Do you sometimes do chemo wraps? I have not. I have so not. I I've been doing some chemo wraps with both imiquimod and 5-FU. Basically, you do a short course of one week, sometimes a little bit longer, but I'm using it in those patients who keep having these squamous cell carcinomas popping up in these areas of previously biopsied and treated squamous cell carcinomas and even recurrences uh, after micrographic surgery. Uh, this is 4% fluorouracil cream. It's kind of a unique form of fluorouracil. It's used once daily for four weeks. You need to tell your patients that it does contain peanut oil if for some reason they tend to have a hypersensitivity reaction uh, to uh, peanut oil. We know a lot about amiquimod. It's in the multiple strengths. I think the most common that is utilized uh, is the 5%. Now, I mentioned this before. The approved regimen is twice a week for 16 consecutive weeks. I don't think there's anyone in this audience that uses that regimen every other day. Uh, some of us use the cancer protocol, which is five on, two off, two to four weeks. Obviously, it's a little bit longer for treating cancer. There, you know, when, when you, when you upregulate or activate toll-like receptors seven and eight, uh, and you're using it in a fairly large area, about 25 centimeters squared, 
And even in larger areas, when we use this on the extremities, I have had some, some patients, or if I'm using it on the chest, get some adenopathy. This really is an immune response modifier. It is a profoundly effective therapy. Um, we know that in the cascade for the development of actinic keratoses, there appears to be activity, the cyclooxygenase pathway. Um, so we know there's uh, angiogenesis that occurs in the setting of photodamaged skin. And one of the effective therapies that we also have in our toolbox is diclofenac. One of the challenges I have in using this uh, agent, which does cause a uh, uh, increased apoptosis, which is one of the reasons why it also works uh, by inhibiting cyclooxygenase. It's just a long course of therapy. It's three months for AKs. Uh, you can use it for actinic elitis. That's a two-month course, but it's, it's kind of a tough sell for treating AKs. You know, ironically, uh, Brett, this is the most, was the most commonly used AK drug in Germany. Wow. People are much more patient outside of North America. Uh, that's great. So we have a polling question as we wind down here. So which of the following is the correct statement regarding terbanabulin? A topical AK therapy applied twice daily for two weeks. Mechanism of action is inhibition of tubulin polymerization. Uh, FDA approval for treating uh, superficial non-melanoma skin cancer and mean local skin reactions peak at day 15 uh, and uh, back to baseline by day 45. Please give your answer. So pretty good job there, but it, good. It'll be a good opportunity for me to tell you a little bit about terbanabulin. Um, its mechanism of action is inhibition of tubulin polymerization intracellularly. Um, it is actually applied um, uh, once daily, and it's only for five days. And so we're going to get into that really right here as we close. So terbanabulin is a 1% ointment. It's applied daily for five days. Um, as I said, it's a microtubule inhibitor. It's a mitotic inhibitor. It kind of crashes that cell cycle, and it does it in a very short period of time. It also does it by inhibiting a protein kinase that we know as a CRC uh, signaling, and it's approved for the treatment of AKs of the face and the scalp. And this is how it works. We obviously have keratinocytic atypia with AKs. Uh, there's microtubule inhibition. I mentioned before there's cell cycle arrest and it results in apoptotic cell death, but not necrotic cell death. And I think that that's one of the unique things about terbanabulin. And it matches up, Leon, pretty nicely clinically with what we saw in the clinical trials because the local skin reactions are fewer, very nice complete responses in the clinical trials, 49% um, versus 9% in the vehicle, and the partial responses were pretty robust at 72% uh, versus 18% uh, over a, a two-month period. I believe exactly 57 days was the clinical trial. Some of the adverse reactions were local skin reactions, application site pruritus, and also some application site pain. And one of the things that important, one of the things I was honing in on this polling question is that what's nice about terbenabulin, it's five days, but the reactions seem to peak. The effect peaks at around day eight, and it starts to fade by about day 15. And by the end of 29 days, you're pretty much done. And in my experience, having used it, it actually appears to really um, end a little bit before even a month in my experience. But that is, you know, that mean. But by about 29 days, everyone was back to about uh, to baseline. And of course, some of these other therapies are a little bit longer. We just went over the clinical trial data. And the nice thing here with this agent is, Five days is a really nice cell. And as long as it's covered, which is sometimes the challenge with new generation therapies, uh, then I think that we really have a nice, effective, short course of therapy, which as we just discussed before, that adherence is important. And I went over the common um, reactions that individuals may have had in the clinical trials, and it was mostly application site pruritus and pain. The most important thing, which is highlighted in red here, is that no subjects in the trial uh, discontinued therapy because of these adverse reactions. And I so think you we know, see that's this... unheard of. That's amazing. I think that yeah. is something that's so important. I, I, when I saw that, it really attracted my attention. It's amazing that nobody stopped, right? That doesn't happen. 
Yeah, I mean, it's very true. In clinical practice, on a day, you know, day to day basis, we have people come back and say, I, I, I can't go three weeks. I can't even go two weeks. They'll call us on their own 5FU and they won't make it that far. Um, and, but even if they do, to have to go through that reaction pattern where we see here that peak at day eight, and one of the other things I didn't mention, so we wind down here, um, is that there's reproducibility of this data. I really like that in both trials. So we see it in both of these uh, you know, trials that led to the approval of terbanabulin. And this really just goes over these local skin reactions and the different components of them. And there was only about 9% of subjects in the clinical trials, Leon, that even had severe reactions. And again, even those that had severe reactions did not discontinue their therapy. And, and this is a pretty typical response as to how someone does. So you see a little bit of erythema encrusting after the five-day application at day eight. Um, and then here's day 15. They're starting to get really a little bit of that downturn, almost getting pretty close to baseline, but with a reduction in that superficial scale that we see in those AKs in that baseline visit. And there you have the uh, day 29 uh, photo there and then the day 57 photo. And this really just reviews all the different protocols and, and we really kind of alluded to some of this, but my point in putting up this slide is that the overwhelming majority of topical therapies that we have are pretty much two weeks or longer. And you know, with this particular agent, it's five days and it's really the only agent that we have in our toolbox right now, Leon, that's that short course of therapy. And, and then, you know, and finally, what I wanted to do as we close here, because I know we're, we're running uh, tight on time here is that Combination therapies are really what it's at. This is an article that was really just published within this past year and really a matter of months. And what they looked at um, are combination-based strategies for treating AKs. And the concept and the point of this study was primarily that on the head and neck, we tend to do very well with our AK treatments that are topical. But when we have to go off of the head and neck, uh, it's really uncharted territory. And whether we use diclofenac, in combination with PDT, although that doesn't necessarily work quite as well. But in Miquimod, even retinoids like adapalene Leon work quite well. We can use them in combination with PDT, whether it's blue light or red light, whether it's ALA or MAL. All of these particular protocols with fluorouracil, even calcipotriene, do quite well. Calcipotriene, I'm sorry, calcip calcipotriol uh, used in combination with PDT works well, but pretty irritating. Well, we alluded to this before, that we can also use uh, uh, lasers, erbium lasers, CO2 laser, and the basic principle is a greater degree of penetrability. In this particular case, we're, we're gonna be able to really get that photodynamic therapy, photosensitizer penetrating better. Uh, and but these are examples here of being able to either use these topicals pre-treatment or post-treatment. And you use your standard protocol. Uh, most of the time, we would use a topical agent, uh, wait about two to four weeks, and then follow with photodynamic therapy. And many of these protocols were done exactly the same way. Uh, very nice article. I really wanted to end here so that we could get to some questions because I know we're running short on time. It was a lot of fun talking talking with you, Dr. Kursik, and, and the fire was nice and warm. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we have a lot of questions. We have limited amount of time. So I'm gonna go through them. Um, and some of them you already answered. Maybe they were asked uh, They were asked before. How about use of 5-FU combined with calcipitroin cream? I think you did already mention that. Um, yeah, listen, it's, it's, it's more than anecdotal. A lot of us have done it in clinical practice. Um, it, it is nice because it is a short course of therapy. I do find it significantly irritating, but when you have an individual with a lot of AKs, I have one particular patient, John, he's loaded with AKs. He just gets squamous cell carcinomas all the time. We've done it to really control both his subclinical lesions that we feel he certainly has. Um, and he really needs that short course of therapy as well uh, because um, he travels a lot. And terbanabulin is a really nice choice for him as well. Right. This is a great question. How to treat acnic chylitis? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, a number of publications that are out there too. Ironically, diclofenac is an agent that I have used before for, for uh, actinic chylitis. 
uh, but it is a two month course of therapy. It just depends on the patient. There's not a yeah. one size fit all. And I like CO2 laser. I, for treating really significant actinic keratin, uh, actinic keratitis, uh, I use uh, a CO2 fractional laser. I actually send them to plastic surgeon for, or somebody who has a CO2 laser. I do the same, even though I don't treat them myself. This is a I good do find that, that, that the topical chemotherapies, other than diclofenac, are pretty egregious. Using 5-FU on the lip, even if it's the short course, the 0.5%, one week or two, very, very tough. I feel like I have better control uh, with uh, CO2 fractional. Yeah. Also, I, I worry about uh, you know, the internal uh, absorption with the, with the 5-FU, so I try to avoid it. Um, this is a good one. Look. I have had a few patients who have completed treatment with Efidex and their skin looks great, but it remains red or even redder. Have you experienced this and when does it go away? Yeah, you know, I, I would check those individuals to see if before you treated them, maybe they had some subtle rosacea. I've had a number of patients stay persistently red who have background rosacea. Yeah. But some people do have PI persistent inflammatory erythema after 5% uh, 5-FU. And I've even had circumstances when it's been so prolonged, like corticosteroids haven't helped. We've even tried topical calcium urine inhibitors. We've had to laser some of those patients. Yeah. How dilate. about chemical pills? Yeah, we use them. I'll tell you where I like them. I don't feel the need for the face as much. I know a lot of colleagues may disagree. I think we have such great topical therapies in the toolbox and PDT. But where I love chemical peels, because I don't like topicals on the extremities and the chest. So we do a lot of TCA range from 20% to as high as even 50%, 50% spotting some of those more hyperkeratotic AKs, and then the background field trying to unleash those subclinical lesions with about 30% TCA. And we wait until frost and then we neutralize it. Yeah, sometimes, you know, I used to the glycolic acid peel and then use the 5-FU solution just one time in the office and they get a really good reaction, but then they end up with a really nice photorejuvenation in addition to the, um, in addition to the AK treatment. Leon, what's the timing of that protocol? What's that timing? Well, I just waited a little bit, the whitening, depending on percent of the glycolic acid you're using, and then add on the, uh, the, the 5 FU solution right there and then in the office, only one time. 2% or 5%? 5%. 5%, the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> the real thing. But it does give you, it's almost, you know, it's not a CO2 laser, but it's, it's, it's really it does a very good uh, photo rejuvenation. Well, that's what happens when you're not the device guy. That's right, you, come, you become creative in a cheap way. <laughs> well, I think we are at exactly at eight, eight o'clock. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. I think that was a great, great chat. I thank you so much, Brad. And I also thank our supporter, Almiral, in this case. And I Im have, uh, I invite you next week, uh, not next week, let's see, when was this? October 25th, very soon on a very exciting, exciting talk on targeted approach to treatment of non-segmental vitiligo by Dr. Heather Woolery Lloyd. So that's gonna be an exciting interactive session. I hope you can all join us on October 25 at 7 p.m. Again, thank you for our supporter, Alminar, and thank you, Brett, very much. Thanks, Roxanne. Good night. Thanks, good night, everyone.